Okay, great. So um, this discussion group is going to be on Africana philosophy and the idea of freedom. And our uh, speaker today is Professor Neil Roberts. Um, uh, and, you know, he's written the most amazing book called Freedom. Um, wait, I've forgotten the title of the book. I'm so sorry. But um, it's, I, I've just, like, the introductory reading was a core reading for this session. Um, and he's just going to talk to us a bit about the idea of freedom and African philosophy. So I'll just hand it over to you. All right. Thank you. And can you all hear me okay? All right, wonderful. <clears throat> Well, it's a, a real delight. Uh, these days in pandemic times, I say good day, depending on where in the world everyone is. Um, uh, but uh, those of you who are, are in the UK, I believe it's about 5 uh, p.m., a little after 5 p.m. time. And so uh, I want to thank you, especially on a Friday <laughs> and probably near the end of the term uh, for joining. And for those who are just um, watching elsewhere, thank you for taking the time to join us. And so uh, again, thank you to the Oxford uh, University Public Philosophy Group. And so uh, since I actually really think the discussion may be uh, the time um, to uh, really kind of foreground, uh, I'll just have some opening uh, remarks. And I believe also on the Oxford Public Philosophy website, uh, the introduction to freedom is uh, the freedom is Maranaj book uh, may be available, and so if so, uh, and even if you have not read that yet, uh, hopefully what I say to open uh, will still cover some of that ground, and then we can talk about uh, the content or anything that um, what I have to say raises. You know, the series that you all have been undertaking has been exploring the field of uh, of Africana philosophy. Uh, and in my estimation, Africana philosophy as a field uh, can be located particularly with um, one date, uh, the date of 1492, when on uh, October 12th of 1492, Christopher Columbus and crew uh, in their first voyage, thinking that they would be uh, arriving in uh, East Asia, arrived on uh, uh, in uh, the Bahamas, uh, and subsequently at that moment, not only with the uh, kind of the subsequent um, processes that would lead to uh, kind of conquest, uh, but particularly uh, the modern conception of race and racial difference uh, and the founding of the modern period. And Enrique Dussel, the Latin American philosopher, I think said it best when he says, you know, we don't live in universes, we live in a, a, a pluriverse, not a universe. And that when we think of modernity, there are multiple modernities, uh, but particularly uh, in the kind of the Western tradition, uh, or what some call the West, uh, 1492 is really the ushering in of the modern period. Uh, and for our purposes, or at least how I understand Africana philosophy, what we now call Africa and the African dis diaspora, and not only Black, but also Creolized populations connected to uh, uh, the diaspora and uh, the refashioning of uh, what we now call Africa itself. It is really that, uh, that moment and its aftermath that uh, in some sense led to the field of Africana philosophy, though the subject matters and figures and texts uh, that we address may predate that period uh, when thinking about the actual field, if this makes sense, when actually thinking about the field. And then within that, uh, there are different schools of thought. But if we look at um, Africana social and political philosophy, because that's going to be my focus, Africana social and political philosophy, there are arguably three questions that animate uh, the tradition of Africana social and political philosophy. And I call them the, the first, the identity question. The second, the equality question. And the third, the freedom question, which will be my main focus, the identity question, the equality question, and the freedom question. And the identity question can be put very simply and directly, even though understanding its contours is complex. A, um, who am I, and B, who are we, right? Who am I, and who are we? The second question, the equality question, uh, really has to be dissected, because oftentimes, just like with freedom, oftentimes when persons say equality, we might not be talking about the same thing. Uh, in the tradition of Africana social and political philosophy, but I would say public philosophy more broadly, um, we may wish to consider the distinction between vertical conceptions of uh, equality and horizontal conceptions of equality. So what do I mean? Vertical conceptions of equality 
uh, a notion of equality that is hierarchical. So if you think about a kind of Euclidean plane, you know, kind of a Cartesian plane, you know, kind of an X, Y axis. Uh, I usually say on, you know, college university campuses, I don't know if this is the case in Oxford, but certainly Williams and other places, you know, do first year students have all of the same rights and privileges and resources than a second year undergraduate? Does a second year undergraduate have the same rights and privileges and resources as a third year? Now let's go on to doctoral students or law students or other professional students. I hope that you get the point, right? <clears throat> that you might be in some sense what Hannah Arendt called equality among equals, right? Is the sense in which vertical notions of equality are within a social, within a kind of a group, there may be similar resources, but then one group might be hierarchy, maybe below a hierarchy or above a hierarchy compared to another. Everyone with me? Vertical conceptions of equality. Compared to horizontal conceptions of equality where uh, abstractly, uh, we all would be considered having the same rights and privileges and resources. And another word for horizontal equality is egalitarianism. And what I posit is that in the tradition of Africana social and political philosophy, there have been attempts to try and figure out why is it that not only Africans, but people of African descent often find themselves in a horizontal relationship, particularly when we think of as Charles Mills and Linda Alcoff discuss in modern settle, settler colonial states in, or hair invoke polities in which racial difference and racial hierarchy were fundamental. How can we move from a vertically equal society to a horizontally equal society? You follow vertically equal society to a horizontally equal society uh, that would be an egalitarian, that would be an egalitarian society, right? Oftentimes uh, there is this conflation. So that's the second question that um, uh, modern Africana philosophy, um, the tradition of Africana philosophy raises. The third, which I'll really focus on is the freedom question. What do we mean by the idea of freedom? What is the relationship between freedom and emancipation or its cognates? liberation or independence and particularly what is the relationship when pivoting back to the idea of freedom between freedom and conceptions of slavery right so we have these three questions the identity question the equality question and the freedom question that i'm arguing animate uh, the tradition of Africana social and political philosophy that has its own different branches from ontology and ethics and epistemology and metaphysics and uh, aesthetics and others, but particularly Africana social and political, uh, political philosophy. And so kind of going more narrowly in my opening remarks, you know, much of my work has been focused on how we get free, right? <laughs> how we get free. And, and, uh, in my uh, book, Freedom is Marinage, where you all had the sample, the introduction, I would kind of locate within that, uh, how we get free. More recently, and I'm happy to talk about this in the conversation, uh, I've been very interested in how we live free. Uh, so what does it mean not only to be living our, uh, a condition that we consider our ideal condition of the free life, but what does it mean to, to live um, even when we might not have ever achieved or might not be living our condition of the free life, right? Focuses on living, but um, but we're going to focus um, before that on discussing how we um, get free. So freedom, as um, you know, Marinage uh, makes several interrelated arguments, but uh, the kind of the first, which comes up in the introduction, is uh, that in my estimation, in you know the Western tradition, and I use Western in the sense that Edward Glissant talks about Western. Edward Glissant in Caribbean discourse has this. It's a footnote, but it's one of the best lines of that important book by the Martinican um, thinker. Glissant says, um, uh, the West is not in the West. It is a project, um, not a place, right? So when thinking about, I rarely talk about Western versus non-Western. And in philosophy and political theory, we see this all the time, right? Even job ads or, or courses you may all be taking or will take talk about Western and non-Western thought. I tend to not use those dichotomies, but at an epistemological level, that is at a level of knowledge, right? There is a way in which the West, as Glissant says, has a certain type of significance. So in the Western tradition, there are arguably, I, I make the argument in Freedom is Marinage that there are arguably kind of two traditions of thinking about the idea of freedom. One, we may call negative notions of freedom, and the second, positive notions of freedom. Now, to be clear, negative and positive here are not ethical it's not an ethical relation. It's not bad and good. Right? <laughs> um, 
it is about, in the negative tradition, we're talking about uh, a couple streams. One, the notion of freedom, if you wanna write this down, freedom as non-interference. And the second, notions of freedom as non-domination. The first negative tradition of thinking about freedom in the West that uh, is this idea of freedom as non-interference. It is the idea of in what way can, can thinking about freedom and thinking about the ways in which, how can we not have another agent or agents encroaching upon us? And what's central to this tradition that was first articulated uh, by Thomas Hobbes in his 1651 uh, work, The Leviathan, and then speaking of Oxford, was read up, so to speak, in a different way by the Oxford Don Sir Isaiah Berlin in the mid 20th century in his essay, uh, Two Concepts of Liberty, is this idea that what does it mean to think about freedom in which we are uh, not interfered with in a non-arbitrary basis? All right, in layperson's terms, what do I mean? Uh, have you ever had a job and then looked, you know, you, you were told what the wage is per hour and then you, or a stipend, and then you, um, you look in your bank account or you get the check and it's not, it is much less than what you thought you agreed upon. I remember that was the case in my first job and I went to my boss and I said, there must be some mistake this was supposed to be my wage. I worked, you know, uh, tirelessly for two weeks and this doesn't meet it. And they said, oh, well, there's federal tax, there's state tax, then there's a county tax, right? And then there was a special, you know, even one-time tax for where I was living at the time. And uh, jokes aside, tax codes are non-arbitrary notions of interference, meaning that whatever we may think of tax codes, we can look it up. You guys follow? We can look it up. We can know what it means. But the second tradition of negative thinking about freedom, what I call the tradition of freedom is non-domination or the civic Republican tradition is what does it mean to think about freedom from arbitrary forms of interference or the credible threat? So when we think in the period of transatlantic racial slavery of figures like not only Frederick Douglass and Harriet Jacob or uh, Kwabna Kugano or various other kind of thinkers uh, who wrote then later autobiographical slave narratives about that experience, of not only being beaten or laboring uh, or forced labor, but even the threat in the middle of the night, just the idea that anyone could encroach upon uh, our being is the idea of the idea of, of, of arbitrary interference and, uh, and the idea of being dominated. Now, what those two negative notions of freedom have in mind is they tell us a lot about the world we don't wanna live in, right? They don't tell us anything or very little about the world we do want to live in. And that's the second tradition, what I call positive conceptions of freedom, such as, uh, plur, uh, such as um, you know, generality or forms of constitutionalism, declarations of independence. These are uh, uh, notions such as uh, kind of plurality. These are uh, notions of thinking about the future. What type of society, what is the social and political order that we all wish to uh, inhabit and chart it out. What are our visions? What are our futurisms? That seems to be the term du jour, right? What are, our, what are the ways of thinking about the future that we wish to inhabit? These are brilliant uh, uh, kind of conceptualizations and modes of constitutionalism. However, they tell us very little about the world we don't want to live in. Not nothing, but very little. So if everyone's with me, there's these kind of negative conceptions and these positive conceptions, um, one telling us a lot about the world we don't want to live in, the second telling us a lot about the world we do want to inhabit, um, but there's a chasm uh, in between. Now, one last move before we get to the centerpiece of freedom is marinage. What connects these negative and positive streams of thinking about freedom in the Western tradition is that whatever freedom and unfreedom mean, these different articulations believe that they're fixed, right? Whatever freedom and unfreedom are, that they are fixed and they're ever changing. But as Bell Hooks and Corner West have said in their own ways, you know, that much of us live in the funk. <laughs> much of us live in not only uncertainty, but much of us live in where either aspiring to or falling out of grace from whatever our versions of conceptions of unfreedom and freedom are. And that ended up years ago getting me thinking about how do we understand that middle area that most of us inhabit? Right? across time, most of us inhabit. And that led me to a single word right? and a single idea, which is the idea of, uh, of marinage. So I, I told our hosts that I only have one slide, so I'm gonna screen share and hopefully 
uh, you'll be able to see this. And then uh, I'll work through it, have some kind of remarks, and then maybe then we can go into the conversation. Does that sound reasonable? Okay. All right. And let's see. Okay. And can you all see this? Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So Marinage has been spelt over time in different ways. I tend to spell it M A W -R, R O N A G, Marinage. And it is a French word that is a noun that has the effect of a verb. Uh, Marinage initially came into being in, uh, if we think during the period of kind of colonial racial slavery, what was known as um, Hispaniola, the contemporary island of Haiti and the Dominican Republic. The term initially referred to Spanish feral cattle that fled from the lowlands, right, to the hills and the kind of the, uh, kind of, um, the, kind of the highlands and also kind of, um, kind of marshes and forests. Uh, subsequently, uh, it then referred to enslaved indigenous populations uh, who were taking flight from plantation uh, slavery, and then by the 1530s to enslaved Africans who were uh, captured, transported through the Middle Passage into what we now call the New World, uh, and, then, uh, and then sold into slavery, uh, and then taking flight from the plantation. Uh, I don't, with your ages, maybe you all might have, some of you may have been too young, but uh, some years ago, but not that long ago, uh, there was a, uh, a major uh, kind of tsunami uh, in East Asia uh, that ended up uh, sadly killing hundreds of thousands of people. A tsunami is something that uh, hits the plate below, an ocean, right below the ocean, plates are hit, water goes up. Once the water goes up, water goes down, uh, and then any thing below because of the pressure, uh, is the subject of that of that wrath, but with GPS tracking, we actually now you know several days after the tsunami, we actually saw um, elephants ended up going into the mountains, and and the idea was that elephants kind of sensed that there was this natural disaster happening, and so they ended up going. And you can see the images of the elephants going all the way up into the mountains, and then once the water then level went back down, then the elephants then came back uh, came back down. This is the similar phenomenon that originally the term uh, that would become Maranage uh, was referring to. Uh, and so now if you wanna look at this kind of image, um, you know, while I do theory, I, uh, I was trained in both black studies and political science. So I can do charts, but this is about as much as you're gonna see. Um, so uh, what this, and these are meant to be androgynous figures. And so one of the uh, kind of central to what I advance in, in, in freedom is Maranage, and I talk about it in the introduction is um, conventionally, um, and I've been told public philosophy at Oxford wants to think unconventionally. So kind of conventionally, um, marinage refers to two forms, petite marinage and grand marinage. Petite just, just means little marinage. And this is referring to individual, at the individual subject lo subjective level, individuals historically who either for an hour, a couple hours, wanted to just take a moment on the fringes of a plantation just to gain some type of um, sustenance. What echoing Audre Lorde, we might call now kind of self-care. Uh, to uh, enslaved persons uh, who might have had loved ones on another plantation, um, going for several hours and then returning, hopefully before being caught. Two individuals going back to Frederick Douglass and Harriet Jacob, but those who might read a, a, a novel such as Colson Whitehead's The Underground Railroad that focuses on the character Cora, who then leaves in the US, Georgia, and then takes flight um, from the South uh, and eventually ends up in Indiana, right? This kind of the individual so-called uh, uh, runaway, the individual maroon. Grand marinage refers here to collectivities of persons who make the decision that in her, his, or their lifetime, they may believe that the regime of enslavement will not be overturned either anytime soon or, or ever. And so uh, it is a, imagine a grouping of persons, enslaved persons, who decide to then um, within a state or within a polity uh, go to and create a territorially bound space uh, then which as best as possible creating their version of living the, the kind of the free life within the strictures of a larger kind of plantation order, right? A larger kind of social uh, and plantation political uh, economy. Now, there are many of you who may just be hearing this and saying, this is all well and good, but 
that seems like a Janus-based freedom because between the Haitian Revolution of 1804 that ends in 1804 and the Cuban Revolution that uh, crescendo in eight, uh, 1959 in the Caribbean, uh, the one uprising that was closest to being classified as a social and political revolution took place in colonial Jamaica in 1865, the Mor Bay Rebellion. And that rebellion was killed uh, because Maroons ended up uh, turning over two of the leaders of the, um, of the rebellion uh, who were then subsequently, or one main leader, Paul Bogle, who was subsequently executed. Because, and I'll just try and use, if you can see my little arrow, uh, a widespread phenomenon of Maroon communities in the Caribbean South America, East Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and other places, was that colonial powers tried to invade these Grand Marinage spaces and they were repelled, they were invaded, they were repelled, they were invaded, they were repelled, and eventually both parties said, this is getting old. How about this? We colonial power will sign a treaty with you and will no longer attempt to invade your territorially bound space so long as you turn over any new runaways. You follow? So another, whoever's in, is in, it's like this, if you're Oxford, if your public philosophy group said this, everyone, we're in, we're in, we're creating our own community. Any new people um, after our session today are out, we're gonna turn you over, so don't even try it. I know you used to take classes with us, but you know, sorry, right? <laughs> um, and, and therefore there is a Janus face history, particularly as historians and anthropologists discuss Maranaj. But if you just bear with me as a thought experiment, what if, and this is a what if, what if not just during the period of trans transatlantic racial slavery, but in ancient Rome, ancient Greece, the Zanj, what were known as the enslaved Zanj of, of what is modern day Iraq, contemporary um, slaves and enslaved persons and enslaved persons into the future. What if we were to understand the idea of freedom as the flight from different forms of enslavement in which flight can be understood not only a at an individual or collective level, but also not merely at a physical level, but also the social, cognitive, and metaphysical. If there are different these different valences of what it means to be not only enslaved and free, I randomly talk about the uh, the series movie series The Matrix, but too much, so I'm just going to bracket that. But if we think about freedom as not merely purely physical, but having these different dimensions. And if we think about freedom as not only thinking, uh, not only kind of taking flight within a larger regime, but in fact, um, thinking about flight as the trend of the transformation of an entire social political order, that the actual process, that's what I want to get at, that for me, uh, and I believe the tradition of Africana philosophy bears this out, that freedom is arguably the process itself, not merely going from and to, but the actual process itself is where freedom um, resides, then we can then think about freedom as flight from the zone of non-being or what Franz Fanon called the zone of non-being, what Fanon said in Black Skin, White Mass, the sterile and arid region in which an authentic upheaval can be born. Because for, for Fanon, uh, the idea uh, of the zone of non-being, like Dante going through the circles of hell, was that we may exist, whether it's in colonialism as an enslaved person or persons, or in different regimes of enslavement, those are hellish regimes but in Fanon's view, those regimes allowed us to come to an awareness of who we are, to exit these, to overcome these conditions of bad faith that delude us that we need to be perpetually kind of enslaved and delude us into believing that slaves themselves um, have had no inherent capacity for action. And if it's not a guarantee that we are going to forge or live the free life, but it is an argument that if we can come to an awareness that we have always had the ability for action and agency, however constrained, then um, from an originary enslaved condition, then freedom is the process of trying to think about how to exit them. Then we can think of Maranaj in two other forms. And this is the only time you'll hear me talk about trickle down anything. Mar uh, Ronald Reagan and also echoed, echoed in a political leader of the UK, Margaret Thatcher, right? The idea of not only Thatcherism, but Reaganomics was this idea of kind of trickle down economics. Sovereign Maranaj, we can understand as a form of trickle down freedom. It's the idea of a, uh, whether through the being of a political leader or a, some sovereign figure, a political leader or a deity or deities, the idea of our individual freedom being filtered through some type of sovereign uh, being from the top down, or thinking about the transformation of an entire social and political order, um, echoing Fanon, what I call sociogenic marinage, from the bottom up, 
or what C.L.R. James said in his pamphlet, Every Cook Can Govern, that all of us, not even merely through electoral politics, but through other channels, right? What, what about thinking about transforming an entire society from the bottom up? And I know I'm happy in the question and answer to talk about the arrows. The short version is so much as we may forge our vision of the free life, we can fall out of grace from that uh, and exit that um, as well. So really where I want to leave it for a conversation is there are these three main questions in Africana social and political philosophy, right? the identity question, the equality question, and the freedom question. Within the freedom question, I want to kind of pose in the get free, before we talk about living free and getting free, if freedom is actually a process, and if uh, flight is not merely purely physical, but has these different kind of valences, and if unfreedom and freedom are always, as I argue in the philosophy of Marinage, ongoing, and that social and political orders re-establish themselves. You all have been dealing a lot with Brexit, the question of Brexit, right? What does it mean to then have a social and political order realign? Uh, the U.S. dealing not only with an election that's been acknowledged by some, but not by others, um, in addition to the pandemic that is affecting all of us. How do social and political orders transform? And, um, and then how do we then make sense of uh, the reality that each of us may have a different idea of what it means to be free? And all of these ideas are occurring at the same time. So is there a vocabulary? My, my, you all might not like Marnage. It's less the term. Uh, final point before our conversation. And I talk about this in the introduction as well, because um, someone who's been extremely influential in, in, in when I was thinking about kind of my earlier work uh, is the Jamaican sociologist uh, and thinker Orlando Patterson. He's written many well-known books. Uh, it's interesting because in the Caribbean and in the UK, many individuals in, through the 1970s knew Patterson as a novelist, primarily a novelist, not in terms of uh, an empirical sociologist, uh, many in, in, uh, across the Atlantic um, from the 80s on know Patterson not as a novelist, but as a sociologist. Uh, and in particular, um, one of his most longstanding books, in 1982, he wrote a, an important book called Slavery and Social Death. And why that book is so important, not just for Africana thought, but those who are interested in studies of uh, comparative studies of slavery, is that it was the first major work to first make the case that stu the study of slave societies whether studying transatlantic racial slavery or ancient Greek slavery, ancient Roman slavery or the Zanj. Before Patterson's work, it was thought that you could only study different slave societies in their, whether regionally or within certain eras and epochs. And Patterson made the argument that th for him, across time, three characteristics define the slave, the condition of powerlessness, dishonor, and what he calls natal alienation, being alienated by, by birth. And that those three conditions create the condition, if you just want to remember Marnage and also remember this term, what Patterson called social death, which in my, my term, not Patterson, is like the living zombie. And for Patterson, slaves across time can only become free if and in a free class enables the enslaved Asian right, uh, to become free. And this idea of social death has been very powerful. It's been redeployed in uh, a group of thinkers uh, around the term Afro-pessimism, uh, kind of uh, this kind of tr tr just, um, notion of Afro-pessimism. However, fundamentally, uh, many Afro-pessimists have equated Patterson's idea of the zone of non-being with, uh, sorry, Patterson's idea of social death with Fanon's idea of the zone of non-being. And I've made the argument in my more recent work about how we live free, not the work that you read, uh, that that is actually not, that is a misrepresentation of Fanon's work all, uh, all together. Social death, it might be a correct view of the view of the slave, which is different than I have it, but it is not a representation um, of, of what Fanon was arguing. Uh, and so I think that's important to bear in mind in our conversation and also thinking about Africana um, philosophy as a tradition and the idea of freedom, because as Audre Lorde said in Sister Outsider and also her uh, work of a burst, uh, a burst of light where she says, what does it mean even when there have been attempts to kill you, whether it was through cancer in the burst of light or whether in terms of terminal cancer or in the period of kind of racial slavery, what does it mean that individuals still survive, right? Nonetheless, or their ideas and their legacy survive even if their bodies uh, and minds um, in uh, uh, reach a period in which they are no longer with us. That how do we make sense of that? That African and creolized communities have continued to not only survive, but to create and to thrive. And I would submit that this is 
encapsulated in the idea of marinage and it's encapsulated in uh, in the wider tradition of uh, Africana and social philo uh, philosophy as we understand uh, freedom. And while I talked about a few interlocutors, I think it's important to say that this tradition is one that is engaged when thinking about freedom and unfreedom, not only um, kind of written text, but audiovisual text, not merely intellectuals connected to colleges and universities or who have masters and PhDs or undergraduate degrees, but the panoply and what Paget Henry calls the kind of the poeticist and the historicist, right? Individuals who are thinking about not only novels and plays and sculptures and painting, but also, um, uh, also, uh, uh, also historicist traditions that have formed not only the Caribbean, but also modern Africana thought. I'm gonna stop there. I think that's around 30 minutes, mas o menos. And, uh, and look forward to um, the, the conversation. Any questions you all may have had either from my opening remarks or anything from the introduction to Freedom is Marinage or, or any questions that you have about, it doesn't just have to be my work, anything you're working on or you've read, everything's on the, the table. Thanks for listening, at least for this first part. Thank you, Neil. Um, I would just like to firstly apologize for like the lack of an introduction and my complete brain fart in the beginning. Oh. Um, uh, like honestly, like just reading your book, I was just too excited by all the things that, uh, you know, going on in my brain and it completely slipped my mind about the social etiquette that you introduce your speaker. So I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, but just from everything you said in the presentation, um, I think one, I think something that I would love to talk, love for you to talk more about. You talk about, you know, not um, engaging with this dichotomy between Western and non-Western. Yeah. But something you write in the book actually is you talk about marinage as a concept, not being anti-Western but being post-Western. Yeah. And you go on to um, use uh, Homi Bhabha's uh, concept of interstices. And I would love to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. if, uh, and also you talk about marinage as a concept and you talked about this a little bit in the presentation um, about having you know trans historical utility yeah. and I, I'm wondering if you could speak about that I mean you know maybe in relation to I guess you know um, our contemporary conversations to do with abolitionism mm -hmm. you know that's all like of course you know been happening for a long time now um, but especially you know with uh, like renewed interest um, and like Black Lives Matter movement all over the world, um, would love for us to hear more about that. Um, and then also, any, I think it would be good if everyone in the audience, instead of, we usually do questions like one person at a time, but feel free to just put stuff in the chat box or like just unmute yourself and jump into the conversation, but yeah. All right, um, so to get us started, so I heard kind of two threads, one, the, um, discussion of not only kind of Western and non-Western and, and, and also um, Marinage's kind of trans-historical, the argument I've made, it's trans-historical utility, but also um, how some of that might connect to these discussions of abolitionism that uh, are, speaking of ongoing, are ongoing, but have had a renewed resonance, particularly with the na national and, and global movement for Black lives. Right? So to the uh, to the to the first, uh, you're right in the introduction to freedom as marinage and make an argument that uh, that the concept is not it's not I say it's not anti-Western, it's post-Western, and the reason why I state that and in many regards it echoes some of the work for another thinker who's been important um, in uh, in my thinking is the, um, the kind of the novelist, uh, dancer, and theorist Sylvia Winter. Um, who I'll come back to in a moment. But um, it does connect to when I was citing Glissant uh, to talk about the, the, his line that the West is not in the West, it's a project, um, not a place, is that um, let's uh, kind of focusing on the Caribbean within which the term marinage emerged, is that the Caribbean as the Antiguan thinker, the late Antiguan thinker and organizer, Tim Hector said, he said, like it or not, the, it is the melting pot, right? The Caribbean is the locus right, of uh, peoples from different parts of the world. And I believe you had my colleague Jane Gordon on earlier in terms of talking about not only creolization and processes and how do we kind of make sense of not only Caribbean identities, but also the, uh, but also the, the kind of the imbrication of the Caribbean uh, 
as C.L.R. James said, with the modern world itself and with the kind of the West. And so um, to think of Marinage as being anti-Western circles back to how I opened when I was talking about the tradition of thinking about um, what is known as a Western tradition of thinking about these kind of negative and positive conceptions of freedom. I'm suggesting that Marinage is not merely a rejection of all of, right, of, of, all of them. And I say this because one of the books, someone who is, I mean, it's very hard to, speaking of uh, ideology, very hard to label. Someone I, I think all of you should read is, if you haven't, is uh, a scholar, a historian by the name of uh, Eugene Genovese. Genovese was very interesting. He was a, a kind of a, a Marxist historian who wrote a lot of important uh, prize-winning books. Then he had a turn to the right in the 1980s, but he wrote a, a really important essay collection, James of which was one of the blurbers, in which um, he talked about Marinage quite a bit and even Marinage within the United States. But he made this argument, which I fundamentally reject, which is for Genovese, Marinage in the, particularly the petite and especially the grand Marinage form was a form of kind of, um, of African retention. He said it was a form of in some sense trying to create, Af those communities were creating Africa in the Caribbean, within the context of uh, Anglo-America, and therefore attempts to completely reject um, kind of Western ways of being and knowing. Now, um, much of that may very well be true in many of those communities. However, because of the location right, and the awareness that even those different kind of territorially bound Grand Marinage communities had with kind of the ways in which kind of Western thought traveled within the Caribbean and uh, and the United States and Canada, that um, that there still is a relationality, right, to kind of uh, to these traditions, even if there is kind of tension. And so, post the idea of modernized being post-Western is really thinking about, in some sense, how do we take into account uh, these varying traditions, but then thinking about well, what happens whether forced or not when these traditions meet, whether physically or intellectually. Uh, what happens next, right? What happens next? And I, I invite everyone to consider the trans-historical utility because there are thinkers particularly connected to um, kind of the new left uh, and figures like Stuart, uh, kind of Stuart Hall, very important um, in not only the Caribbean, but also the UK and cultural studies who uh, talk about kind of um, conjunctures, right? That's a kind of their, their, their kind of fancy term to say, um, are there not these historical moments in which terms or movements or actions um, and developments kind of erupt that are incommensurate, right, with other historical conjunctures? Really important. And I take that um, to heart um, very seriously. But, um, but I'm interested in particularly, without getting rid of the historical particularities of these conjunctures or certain types of eruptions, what does it mean to talk about concepts that, that can actually kind of travel? So I think of, for instance, while I don't write about it in that book, a term like intersectionality, which has been, I think, wielded and also misused in different ways. But Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined this term in the late 1980s in a law review article, um, Crenshaw was very upfront when she was trying to, within the space of kind of anti-discrimination law, uh, which in the United States context, which is different than jurisprudence in the UK, before um, the 1990s in American jurisprudence, if someone was, for instance, the victim of a hate crime that targeted one's um, racial identity or age or ability or sex or sexuality, uh, gender, uh, and other categories in the law, in anti-discrimination law, one was only able to sue, one was able to only bring a case in the courts by one of those so-called identitarian issues. And Crenshaw said, <laughs> echoing a long tradition of black feminism, uh, that that human, the human being is made up of multiple, right, uh, of multiple identities. That's what makes us human. But important to this, my point is that Crenshaw is saying, uh, I, she's using the term intersectionality, but she makes no claim that I just discovered this, right, in 1989. You guys follow? I just discovered this in 1989. She's saying, no, figures like Anna Julia Cooper in the 19th century, uh, uh, many Black women, uh, both uh, after emancipation and before, were forging these conceptions, um, both known and unknown in the historical records about this idea. But it gives, it, 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 was, it was given a, a, a term at a certain moment. And that's how I see Marinage. In the 1530s, we get this term, right? In the 1530s, we get this term. 
that in many regards encapsulates a particular form of flight that in my estimation has utility for us at a conceptual level of thinking about how we understand freedom, both for that 1530s moment, both during the period of, of transatlantic racial slavery, but where Patterson and I, Orlando Patterson and I are in deep agreement is that there are discussions of slaves and slavery that, that actually should be understood not only comparatively, but across epochs, up, across time periods. And so that's the utility. And going to your third kind of dimension of your question with regards to abolitionism, uh, I guess I wish I should have shared it if it was interest, but I have a, any day now, there's a, a piece I have coming out. It's called Angela Y. Davis, um, Abolitionism, Democracy, and Freedom. And I'm, hope, I'm happy to share either with you and share with others. But in essence, um, what I try and argue in, uh, in the long essay is that, um, you know, first of all, Angela Davis is a figure more known for who Davis is rather than her writings. Um, but both in who, not only who Davis uh, is, but also her writings and her activism, Davis uh, has argued, I contend, for a notion of abolitionism that we can understand as the, uh, the kind of the rejection of slavery in all of its form, past, present, and future. Abolitionists are often um, historically associated with kind of 17th, 18th, 19th century um, activists in the UK, Canada, the Caribbean, um, uh, the United States and, and other kind of spaces. But Davis and, and contemporary abolitionists have said that no, abolitionism is the rejection of slavery in all of its forms across space and time and all types of actions to, to mitigate or in an ideal sense, uh, eradicate forms of enslavement uh, that may mutate across time, such that um, there have been particular preoccupations of Davis, three. One, right, kind of abolitionism understood in terms of racial slavery. Two, uh, abolitionism regarding the death penalty. And three, abolitionism regarding kind of jails and prisons. So if we, if we meditate on that third, and I'm gathering, but correct, push, push back if I'm wrong, in terms of contemporary abolitionists, uh, have focused a lot of attention on what we might call now echoing Michelle Alexander, not only mass incarceration, but the phenomenon of the new Jim Crow. And, and so we see not just in the, the Americas, but also in the UK and all across the world, right now in terms of the, for those not paying attention, the end SARS movement in Nigeria, speaking of Africana philosophy, very important, right? What does it mean even in the African context to talk about not only police brutality, uh, but also forms of kind of carceral uh, kind of carceral punishment. What does it mean to then think about the prison jail, but also the prison as an institution that um, has mutated a form of enslavement? And then what does it mean to not merely talk about reform, right? Not merely talk about reforming, but also talking about the kind of the upending and the kind of the, um, uh, what Davis calls decarceration. What does it mean to then talk about decarceration? And I, and I see that, um, I think I believe the phenomenon of marinage actually kind of maps on to a lot of those claims. In other words, to be clear, it's not that um, those um, embracing the idea of marinage and ideal are all abolitionists. But what I'm suggesting is abolitionism as an idea that there are ongoing struggles against right, slavery in all of its forms. I'm suggesting that the process-oriented nature of struggling to, to kind of undo but also the ways in which, depending on the society, and especially the US as the kind of global, sadly global case study in which after the late 90s, right, the kind of exponential spike in, um, in um, uh, an expansion of jails and prisons and in, uh, incarcerated persons overwhelmingly black and brown uh, in, uh, within those spaces uh, and poor people, that, um, that that's, I, I think that there's kind of more work to be done to, to kind of think about that. So hopefully I'd got to some of what you had, um, uh, some of what you had uh, mentioned, but uh, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, yeah, like when I read that idea of like post-Western, I, you know, you mentioned Jane Anna Gordon and that was immediately what I was thinking about, this idea of creolization that she talks about. Um, and I think that as regards to what you just said about abolitionism, you talk about, you know, um, freedom as being a state of being. Um, you know, and I mean, like, it, it, uh, it's something that I was constantly thinking about, actually, like, you know, reading your idea of freedom as marinage was um, anarchist philosophy, you know, David Graeber had this uh, thing he used to say that you must, like, you know, live as if you are already free. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, like, in some sense, 
that like you know like um you know even um you talk about marinage um and like maroon and like maroon communities as being these heretical non-state actors um and i think that like in a lot of ways um like a lot of anarchist philosophies um espouse these sentiments mm -hmm. um and i think that's really interesting considering a lot of black radical thought is actually um much more like communist than it is anarchist um and i also i mean i like there's just too many things to say but um i also thought it was very interesting the idea that you used um this idea of like you know state of non-being and ideas of social death that you know absolutely inform afro-pessimist thought in order to like actually um make an argument for a very um like quite an optimistic argument i would say um but yeah i mean i would love for you to talk a bit more about that but i'm sure there's a few questions we'll get to that before um, yeah well, as um as maybe others are thinking about questions, can I at least say something about the the anarchism? Um, please, part? please. So um, there's a wonderful book um, that came out in the early 2000s, I believe 2001, um, but that date might be a little off. By uh, a political scientist, uh, a well-known political scientist named Michael Dawson, uh, and Dawson uh, wrote this book. Um, as in some sense, a culmination of several works he'd been working towards in terms of trying to articulate, uh, in his view, a tradition of black political thought, but his particular expertise and focus was mainly on um, African-American political thought, uh, though he was still influenced by thinkers outside of that tradition. And what's fascinating about this book that is, in my estimation, a work of philosophy and political theory backed up by some kind of empirical, he's, uh, Dawson's also kind of a number cruncher, is that um, he articulates all of these di these different branches. So he talks about black liberalism, or what he calls disillusioned liberalism, and black feminism, and uh, uh, Marxism, and communism, and these various traditions. But then he makes a statement that I found so um, provocative, and then one in which I, I said over time, I, I don't know if this holds, is he said, the one tendency that black political thought in his view has never um, entertained is anarchism. <laughs> and, and on that one, I said, you know, um, it was just so ironic because the thinker Cedric Robinson, uh, and particularly not only Robinson's work, Black Marxism, but also his work on black movements and cinema. Uh, Robinson, I mean, much of black Marxism, a large, one of the largest of black Marxism is simply dedicated to different maroon movements, right? In kind of Brazil and you know Jamaica and Haiti and, and, and within the US, et cetera. And Robinson making an argument that I think a lot of thinkers, particularly a lot of black intellectuals and activists in Canada, actually, quite frankly, right now, uh, who have been actually charting uh, black anarchist, um, uh, kind of long black anarchist traditions and the ways that maroon communities actually fit um, kind of fit. Yeah, uh, even like the idea of communes and black yeah. feminist ideas, right? Throughout, yeah. you know, the late 20th century. Exactly, um, exactly. So, but uh, anyway, so, but I, I, we're talking, I, I would love to hear from, from other people here if you, if you have questions, um, anything. <laughs> hey, I feel like I need to say something about the anarchism part. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've, like, I identify as anarchist and as then, so it's it, like organizing spaces in the Caribbean and from Barbados and it's just, there's this constant, and when you have these leftist organizations, it's constant kind of old guard, Marxist Leninist idea um, group that just is trying to relive the old days of the revolution in <laughs> Grenada or Cuba or wherever. and. It's kind of frustrating because there, there always is that tendency. There, there's a good book um, by a small press on our own authority publishing. Um, can't remember the exact name, but it's the writing of Joseph Edwards, mm -hmm. who was a Jamaican, right? And he was really quite anarchist in his thinking. And really interestingly, he, he was a Rasta. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Rastas are, are a contradiction <laughs> because at some point they're, they're they are quite anarchists in how they want to live and how they see the world, the ideal world being. Mm -hmm. But um, but then also, you know, they revere Haley Selassie and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. And quite like to also embrace, I think, quite a few 
patriarchal and homophobic norms as well. So, I mean, I love Rasa, but yeah, there's all sorts of things going on there. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not sure I have a question, but it's just, um, um, the, the intersection between blackness and anarchism, I think yeah. is really worth a lot of exploring, even though kind of the, the historical movements that identify themselves as anarchists mm -hmm. tended to shift around the blackness where blackness was influenced more by the more state forms of socialism. But for example, in, um, in Tanzania, Nerere's Ujama villages, I think those almost got to quite a, a great uh, autonomous anarchist almost functionality. But then of course they were crushed by the state like everything else that anarchists do. Um, so it, the, the impulse is always there and you can trace it and find it. But just because there haven't been any unions that identified themselves so much as this is an anarchist union so forth doesn't mean you can dismiss it as not a black idea. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have some thoughts, but it, it looks like there's also some, at least someone else who wanted to um, jump in. So I can take a couplet if that helps. I can either answer or take a couplet. Is that okay? Yeah. I have something to say about that. And then I, I could also ask another question, but I can save it also. Okay. Um, what do you want to do? I just think it's interesting. I brought, I brought up a similar point. I described to somebody Black Lives Matter as anarchist. And I think that they took that as like an accusation and not like a political descriptor. But I think it's really interesting when people like are so resistant to the idea of blackness and anarchism. Like it would be like when one of the fundamental critiques is of state power interfering in people's lives. Like it would be Marxist Leninist that Black Lives Matter were saying, oh, the issue is police don't have class character. Yeah. Nobody's saying that, you know, people are saying the issue is state authority, but fundamental organizing principles like mutual aid, decentralized leadership, like to its core, it's politically anarchist, um, which I think is, is so interesting that there's that resistance. I don't know, should I ask, like it's an unrelated question. Should I just ask it now or like come sure. back to it? Sure, yeah, okay. now and then, I'll, and, then I'll, and then I'm gonna, I'll circle back and I see also a question in the chat. So I'll do those and then maybe go to the chat one right after, yeah. Um, so, so the question is, I, I'm trying to think of the best way to word it, but I think that a lot of like the creolizing theory that you and Jane Gordon have been putting out is so oriented around like destabilizing these ideas of like, you know, like you said, like the binaristic idea of like freedom, not freedom, mm -hmm. or, you know, subject object, or yeah. And so I guess, I guess my question is part of it is, is the idea of like the idea of the individual subject mm -hmm. and freedom. Um, it, it, it seems like if you like look at Harriet Tubman, like, like the whole kind of process, not just of fleeing, but of returning and going back and kind of recovering more people like you talk about in the context of, of, of Whitehead's novel. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that there's kind of a blur between freedom and obligation, mm -hmm. which seem to be very distinct concepts in like Western philosophy, where freedom is kind of enacted through like a relationship with others mm -hmm. and valuing other freedom you know like tony morrison said um the function of freedom is to free someone else i'm paraphrasing but um i'm wondering if you could ref like speak about the relationship between freedom and obligation the relationship between the individual and the community i know that's like a huge question but um I, just I, kind I, of that yeah I think I, I think I think i get it so um uh so thank you um for that so to the uh kind of the first set of kind of questions and um, points, especially Rastafari came up in Tanzania. For those who haven't read a wonderful book, um, uh, it's called Jack Kingdom by Monique Badas, uh, who wrote the first book a couple of years ago, the first book on Rastafari in, in, in Tanzania. So I'm really glad that both of those things came up. And actually how I not only end Freedom is Marinage is actually the, the, the kind of the, the epilogue is on the Rastas, but also um, the kind of one of the books I'm finishing up is on Rastafari political um, thought. And so, you know, I'm glad that you, you mentioned this because, you know, um, whenever I say, you know, there are people who ask me and say, well, what do, what do Rastas believe? And I'm like, what do the Christians believe? You know, there's usually the, the, the Rastafari. What, I was like, what do the, what do the Muslims believe? What, uh, what do those who are Jewish believe? You're like, well, actually there are different branches of the movement. I was like, well, there are also different branches in what Rastafari call 
uh, houses and mansions of the faith. Now there are certainly ideals that connect those, but there are distinctions, and that brings in a lot of the uh, a lot of discourse that um, uh, uh, that uh, that is kind of difficult. Not only questions of kind of patriarchy and homophobia, but also uh, other questions that are in the kind of global public sphere now in terms of reparations for historical injustice and sovereignty and others. And so uh, one of the areas I talk about at the end of the book that Rastafari has not just the, the faith, but also the movement brings up those differing dimensions of Maranaj that I was attempting to articulate, but also uh, it is a kind of a, a movement at a crossroads that um, that is still uh, unfolding. But getting to that question of uh, the follow-up on black and anarchism, one of the, um, the kind of the, the, my next book, How, how to Live Free in it, uh, I'm finishing up How to Live Free in an Age of Pessimism, makes a distinction within it between governance and rule, between governance and, uh, and rule. So oftentimes when politics is discussed, and especially when um, there are those who critique whatever their bel beliefs of anarchist politics are, uh, that the assumption is that um, there is a ruling class or a ruling group or a ruling individual or individuals, and that there are those who might, for instance, want to either replace altogether one form of rulership with another. So let's say you have a political leader or a political party. Let's get them out. Let's get the new political leader and political party in who can then now rule, right? Or thinking about um, anarchist politics as that there is a form of rulership and therefore it's about um, just kind of uh, uh, kind of pure chaos and, no, and disorder and, and, and no focus. But what I argue in this next book is that um, if we make a distinction between rule and, um, and governance, whereas you know, rule coming from kind of our kind, the kind of the sense of that, that oftentimes rule, rulership is connected with notions of um, arbitrary and non-arbitrary forms of kind of domination. But, um, but, but oftentimes, not only kind of maroon communities, but also some different kind of black anarchist organizations and different anarchist kind of political tendencies are actually not um, simply seeking to destabilize forms of rulership to then enable another form of, uh, of collectivities to then kind of institute their own rule, for instance, maybe within their group but in fact are enacting a form of, of thinking about governance. That's why I brought up that pamphlet by CLR James that you actually, if you Google even, you can find online, um, Every Cook Can Govern, where James uh, published the pamphlet in the 1950s after seeing the Hungarian revolution and he had already been written extensively on the Haitian revolution and was trying to make sense of the, the anti-colonial movements in the Caribbean, but he sees what was going on in Hungary, this two week revolution that gets killed and then he's ultimately looking and seeing he said no this is he's different what he saw is workers councils it's very strange that james and also hannah aren't were fascinated by these workers councils but for completely different reasons but for james and others they were looking at this and i take that looking at these councils that organically came up to think about how can we transform a society from one centered on rulership ruling or being ruled right um uh, mastery and slavery right to one in which it's about governance, in which yes, there are electoral politics, but there are also other channels of, of ways in which we can actually participate uh, in the, as members of the demos. And that gives us then a different understanding, not only of, uh, of uh, you know, bar, uh, kind of Barbados, I think that the work of, um, uh, you know, uh, I mean, there's several works dealing with kind of not only Barbados and also Jamaica that really speak to this, um, Marissa Fuentes, book Dispossessed Lives is brilliant on this. Again, a historian, but I think a lot of philosophers and theorists would be well to do it, where Fuentes is looking at kind of fugitive um, enslaved um, fugitive women in colonial Barbados and the ways in which um, their kind of being then, um, some of which living anarchist lives, others of which are at the whim or the of the arbitrary will of, the, of master class, but also thinking about these challenges to rule and thinking about kind of governance and certainly also uh, the connection to of Rastafari back to Rastafari and the circulation to Africa itself, the ways of vectors. Uh, there are kind of Africans in the diaspora and then there's diasporic political thought and social and political thought that impacts back to the continent. And then in terms of shifting to our second kind of uh, commentator in terms of the question of not only is Black Lives Matter, the movement for Black Lives, is that anarchist or not? But it sounds like this larger question about um, uh, kind of creolization and, and, and if there is in some sense the, the kind of um, suspicion of binaries, 
maybe how I'd phrase it, suspicion of certain types of binaries, what then is the relationship between kind of the individual to the collective, what I was getting that on the one hand, um, and I, I mean, I guess what I would say, not only in the individual collective, but I also heard freedom and obligation. Um, I actually think a term that's particularly in the Africana philosophy, and not merely kind of Africana philosophies of existence, but also kind of more broadly, I think a much more um, kind of useful concept is responsibility. What is the relationship between freedom and responsibility? Because you, what was brought up was, for instance, Harriet Tubman, you know, and I guess I gather Tubman was brought up. To what degree does one have a responsibility when Tubman was in, in originally kind of um, taking flight from uh, uh, enslavement in Maryland and then, then eventually going not only to then get family members and loved ones and then subsequently to then get try and uh, get other enslaved persons and then when we get in 1977 a group of black feminists who then named themselves the Kambahe River Collective right focusing on Harriet Tubman uh, who then was a kind of um, also working as not only a spy during uh, on the union side but also going into the, the heart of the confederacy and then also trying to then uh, help to uh, extricate different enslaved persons on a mass scale and then bring them back. There is this relation, there is a sense in which, yes, that does bring up obligation, but one wonders if we're talking about, though, a larger question of kind of responsibility. And that is an ex a kind of a question of a philosophy of existence to the degree to which it raises the issue of, well, what do each of us, what type of responsibility do we have to anybody else? <laughs> Um, and, and that's why I, I really wanted to underscore when thinking about Maranaj, whether you all reject it, accept it, or accept it only in part, that um, the kind of, is it individual or is it collective, that the dichotomy doesn't work. But, but pause for a moment. It's not that it's about, in this case, breaking, purely breaking dichotomy. It's that there are times when, um, you know, uh, we all, we each have our different conceptions of what the free life means. It's probably already clear that sociogenic marinage is the one I want to cast my, my lot into, but um, I always go back to, and I've said this kind of publicly before, I, I, I talk about Octavia Butler, another figure who I, I, I've been returning to um, in recent years, is, um, you know, at a certain point, Butler had just decided, Butler didn't want to live around anyone, and just for a long period of time, didn't, you know, didn't, and people ask her, well, why, why did you do that? And, I just didn't really feel like being around other humans or other people or other beings um, for this period of time. And that was important for her conception of what does it mean to not only get free, but live a free life. And then at a certain point, but, uh, Butler decided um, that she wanted to um, uh, kind of interact intersubjectively with, um, with, with others. I don't think I, I can simply say, well, that was an illegitimate, <laughs> right, um, move, and that's not really what freedom means. Yes, I believe, for me, in terms of how my vision of the free life is a macro-political one that does take into account individual actions, but also social structures, but there are these kind of differing, kind of these differing and overlapping and sometimes distinct um, articulations, and so I would pose, you know, what the Ghanaian thinker, the Akan thinker Kwame Jeche in Tradition and Modernity talks about where where Jache says, especially in different forms of West African political thought that get reduced to, you know, this kind of the individual versus the community, right? In other words, Africans are communitarians. And he says, you know, it's not uh, communitarianism versus individualism. It is thinking about what is the individual's relationship and his earlier work, an essay on African philosophical thought where he looks at the Akan within Ghana and, and thinks about, well, what are our relationship to not only ourselves and our community, but to ancestors? What is our, what is, and I think that would, fall into not only whether it's obligation, but also responsibility. What do we individually and collectively have responsibilities to ancestors who may have experienced a historical injustice and there has not been rectification or restitution for that injustice that has had the weight and has been carried across time. Um, so there's more, there's more nuance. Certainly the community is important, but uh, I would say, especially in kind of Africana social and political thought uh, in the modern period, the, to kind of reduce it to it's all community or, or maybe we need to focus on the individual um, in some traditions and not, uh, not the collective, that doesn't actually get at the nuance. And I think that's why, well, it wasn't the focus of my talk, it was more Jane Gordon's um, perhaps, um, but, uh, but I do think that, um, uh, I do think that there's room to, to kind of think about the kind of, um, the kind of the relationship between individual and collective subject and, uh, and larger collective group that um, 
that give us texture to the the layers of uh, kind of 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 of, of freedom. Um, I hope I got to most or some of what you were were asking. Um, yeah, should I perhaps in terms of the chat? Should we go to the chat or did or? Okay. The... Yeah, um, I would I I'll read out the questions in the chat just for the recording. But actually. Um, um, <laughs> being a bit cheeky, but I will just yeah. ask a question about something that you just said. Um, you obviously are making this distinction between governance and rule, and yeah. um, it, it was very interesting, uh, you know, the sort of discussion you go into about Orlando Patrice and Dwar, yeah. and something that he makes the case for um, is this idea of, like, you know, democracies um, being entrenched in ideas of misogyny as well as racism. You know, he gives the example of Athens and the United States, like, you know, he calls them, you know, the first and one of the largest democracies um, historically. Um, and I guess I was wondering, like, you know, like, the, like these ideas, these democratic ideals have, you know, have also created the distinction between the governance and rule. And I guess I'm wondering, like, you know, how does that um, with what you're suggesting, but maybe you can answer that last, and yeah. we'll do the questions in the chat. Yeah, so I'll uh, I'll keep that here, and then and then you can hold me to it to circle back. How does that sound? Great. So um, first one was, could you please talk more about the relation between getting and living freedom, freedom as process, and how this relates to hermeneutics slash teaching and philosophy to practice? Do yeah. you just want me to read out all the questions? Um. You know, maybe take um, yeah. Let's let's uh, how about yeah. Read those out, and then I'll uh, and then I'll 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 take them. Perfect. Okay. Um, and then the next one was um, as a British Nigerian, I'm really interested in hearing more about your thoughts on the NSARS movement. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, um, could you speak on how petty marriage be applied to living today? Um, as Cat Stevens sang, "If you want to be free, be free." Okay. Oh, okay. Cat Stewart. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to take maybe question two first, and then I'll go to one and then three. Yeah. Uh, with regards to um, the NSARS um, movement. So I'd hardly consider myself an expert, but one of my um, kind of colleagues who not only teaches and works in African history and also politics, um, we actually had hosted at Williams a forum today is Friday on um, earlier this week on the NSAR uh, protests. And um, some things do kind of do strike me, both about the resonance with the movement for Black Lives, particularly in the US, but also the ways in which um, the movement for Black Lives has taken on um, its own form. So going back to kind of Africana philosophy, a text that I always teach is Kwame Anthony Apia's um, In My Father's House. And um, why I teach that text is that um, kind of within it, um, not only is the prose just beautiful, you know, even for a work from the early 1990s, um, but, you know, Apia raises a question and it really is a question. He, um, you know, because some of the kind of, kind of critical reception of the work is Apia's discussion of Pan-Africanism and particularly Alexander Crummel and W.B. Du Bois where Apia suggests that in some ways, in his view, there's been a, a, uh, a racial conception of Pan-Africanism that was brought, so-called brought to the continent by New World kind of Africans, right? <laughs> kind of New World Black people. And for Apia, that has had some kind of unfortunate kind of consequences. Um, while we might disagree on, on that, um, it, he does bring in the point, which is, what does it mean when not only um, there's kind of Africa in diaspora, but then there's developments in diaspora that impact the continent? And in terms of the NSARS movement, I think what's so fascinating about the protest is that um, what we didn't see in Ferguson in terms of international scale, and we did see with the kind of the killing of um, George Floyd and also Breonna Taylor, especially though not exclusively, but particularly George Floyd, was then this na not just national and hemispheric, but really global um, uh, discussion about what is the value of black um, life and how do we even understand blackness in the continent of, of Africa. So speaking particularly with Nigeria, when you have this kind of squad, so to speak, this kind of SARS as an acronym for this kind of police squad and the protests that are in many regards really raising the issue about what does it mean to then in a population that 
overwhelmingly would be considered quote unquote, racialized as black, right? In the kind of modern kind of sense. Um, what does it mean even when you have a black majority at the subnational level when there are not only different ethnic groups, but also there's relationships between the kind of the, the kind of the state and then citizens, or at least the state and inhabitants of the of the state. How do we talk about even when there is um, kind of um, it might even be the kind of police who are kind of black officers who are then or African uh, kind of black Africans or black Nigerian Af Afro Nigerians inflicting violence on other Afro Nigerians. How do we have this kind of discussion that black life is meaningful? So simply to be an officer who then identifies or is identified as black or black African or black Nigerian does not mean that one cannot be internalizing or exhibiting forms of anti-black racism and violence. Does it make sense? So to your kind of question, why do I think, what do I think about the movement? I think what we see in that movement, what um, I realize Oxford has its own area and there are different territories. You know, you have your Oxbridge, Cambridge dispute, but Bristol is where in the UK, the few times I've had the fortune to be, Bristol is where I think I've connected the most with. And I was just captivated that within days after George Floyd, the video of George Floyd's um, kind of murder came out, then the figure of who is the really the kind of the University of Bristol, much of the resources and in town, the images of one of the biggest slavers, person who made their money from the slave trade, that image of the statue going down, right, and then being dragged and dumped into the, right, dumped into the river, right? There's been this circulation of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of that, and I think that really kind of speaks to this NSARS, um, the NSARS significant, how it's kind of has ramifications within um, Nigeria, but also I would say kind of it's a global network. With regards to um, getting free and living free, I'm realizing because of time, we might need a whole nother session for that. But if I were to really boil it down, um, I have been, and I'll just kind of read this, I'll read this, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a volume that, that uh, by, Audre Lord, it's called um, A Burst of Light in Other Essays. And so, you know, Audre Lord was, um, you know, she passed away from cancer, but she had two kind of serious bouts with cancer, one um, breast cancer, and she wrote journals that were collected called the cancer journals. Um, but then subsequently, Lord um, was diagnosed with terminal uh, liver cancer that she found out originally emanated from the breast cancer coming back and then metastasizing, okay? And so this volume has different essays, but the large majority of it are these daily diaries, essentially, yeah, daily diaries um, talking about what does it mean to um, to kind of live and it's just really um, powerful, moving. Sometimes you have to put it down and, and, and come up, but I, I just read this. This was the from the last part. This is from August, 1987, where Lord says, cancer itself has an anonymous face. When we are visibly dying of cancer, it is sometimes easier to turn away from the particular experience into the sadness of loss. And when we are surviving, it is sometimes easier to deny that experience. But for those of us who live our battles in the flesh must know ourselves as our strongest weapon in the most gallant struggles of our lives. And this is at the end, or near the end, going down. Living with cancer has forced me to consciously jettison the myth of omnipotence, of believing or loosely asserting that I can do anything along with any dangerous illusion of immortality. But nonetheless, Lord writes at the end, I work, I love, I rest, I see and learn, and I report. These are my givens, not sureties, but a firm belief that whether or not living with them with joy prolongs my life, it certainly enables me to pursue the objectives of that life with a deeper and more effective clarity. And she was writing from Curacao slash Grenada slash Anguilla slash the British West Indies slash St. Croix Virgin Islands, August 1987. And I say that because, um, you know, I found Maranage to be a way to, to kind of think through, yeah, that question of not only how do we get free, but Lord, especially, but, but others, and even just the kind of moment we're facing ourselves during a pandemic. I just want to come back to it. We are in a pandemic, right? We are in a, we are in a public health pandemic and one still connected to questions of racialization and rule and governance and others. But, um, you know, Lord did not, on the one hand, she wasn't naive enough to, um, to romanticize forces that seem to always be kind of weighing down herself and people who either looked like her or connected to her, her uh, to her, but at the same time she had this wavering belief uh, 
and I'm not using the term optimism, but a belief in terms of that social and political order that, that kind of, as Frederick Douglass says, that struggle is necessary for progress, but that we needed to really think of not only what type of world we don't want to live in, but also really kind of work to actualize the world that we want to live, uh, to be in, even if we don't see it, right? And that, that taking different moments to then even just reflect on right now, just, you know, like, how are we living right now are really important, right? Because remember what I was saying earlier, that freedom, the valences arguably aren't just the physical, they're also the mental, it's kind of metaphysical, the psychological. And that if we, if we focus then more on living and our relationships with not only ourselves but one another, that's a entirely that's a related but a different set of um, kind of set of questions and set of types of answers. So it really it really is about um, you know uh, uh, you know I'll just kind of briefly end by saying you know that that um, this means this is more a focus on our kind of everyday actions right everyday imaginings. And, and how that actually has value. So lived experience for me, I think when thinking about freedom uh, has a lot, of, uh, a lot of value. And that's why I think the movement for black lives is really, it's, just, it's white, it's black, the first acronym, right? Kind of black lives matter, right? And the movement for black lives, it's about life and, and living, even if there are reasons to be pessimistic, um, history, uh, is still on the side of those who have continued to not only survive and struggle. And to Petit um, Marinage, if I understood the question in terms of um, how could Petit Marinage be applied um, uh, applied today? Um, there are, I mean, there are. <laughs> where do we begin? There are so many different um, uh, kind of ways of uh, of of thinking about it. There are individuals. I, I think more most immediate. When we think of, um, um, you know, one of the things I've kind of written about before is what I call the, the refugee hyphen immigrant, right? In terms of not only kind of global um, uh, kind of politics, but, but if we think of, uh, and I also don't say refugee crisis because crisis has some type of, uh, at an ethical level, bad connotation that there's something wrong. But the question about, um, and this does also connect to Rastafari, right? For a long time, Rastaf many Rastas have talked about what does it mean to go back to so-called one spiritual homeland as Ethiopia? <laughs> um, but also for those individuals who might be kind of migrants, not simply because they're simply choosing, but are living in a context in which the polity that they're in or space that they're in, it's not sustainable um, to be. Whatever, however love one may have from a homeland, sometimes individuals need to leave. So if you're thinking about those who are because of geopolitical reasons or economic reasons are, 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 are and not just merely coming with family, but are coming by themselves, right? Are taking flight. Uh, and how do we think about borders, kind of cosmopolitanism? Um, how do we actually understand, uh, think about world citizenship beyond kind of passport, one's papers, one's documentation? That is one way to kind of think about it. And then there's, there's forms of petite marinage that um, that are not necessarily connected to that, that are occurring even within kind of polities and, and different expanses. So I know you probably wanted different types of examples, but I think that it's not even about is petite marinage happening today. Petite, uh, I'm suggesting petite marinage, grand marinage, sovereign marinage, sociogenic marinage. These are these have always been going on, and these will always uh, continue to go on. But I really appreciate that question because I think that there are differing um, kind of forms. Uh, there are kind of different forms of it, but that kind of the actions themselves. Uh, I think um, are, are are still nonetheless valid. And to the point that our moderator was talking about in terms of uh, of uh, you know of democracy, you know I think that um, ultimately when one looks at while this is outside of the tradition of Africana philosophy, different Africana philosophy philosophers have um, uh, engaged with different forms of Platonic thought, and particularly Plato's. Republic, whereas Plato was a, a critique of, uh, of democracy, Plato posited that there were five types of regimes of which he had uh, democracy as the fourth or fifth, right? <laughs> right? One, only one slot before tyranny. And I take it that Plato, via his articulation of Socrates, was, um, uh, was critical of democracy is that oftentimes, in his view in ancient Athens, that there were, there were polities calling themselves democracies, but then democracies then kind of devolved, right? <laughs> they kind of devolved, or they weren't even really, they called themselves democracies and they didn't even really live up to these types of um, ideals. So why even try and aspire to it? That's where I differ with the kind of the platonic um, notion. But I think Plato was right 
by Socrates to suggest that there are, there are polities that call themselves democracies that then themselves don't necessarily kind of inhabit that. And that's why I think connecting it to the earlier question about abolitionism, I think this is why a figure is like Angela Davis, but not just the figure of Davis, but contemporary uh, abolitionists, the work is so important insofar as many abolitionists are not saying we're rejecting the idea of, of, of kind of, of um, democracy or democratic republics. What they are calling into question are, are polities that state that they are democracies. I mean, we all see this range of books, how democracies die, democracies are dying, you know, some form of threat to democracy. By persons writing from the perspective that making the assumption that the societies that they're living in are themselves already democratic, they've been democ democracies, right? The assumption is a prior, these are democracies and something's happening to them to undercut that. Rather than saying, if we take de Tocqueville's um, view that there are democratic experiments, but that an experiment doesn't mean that you actually achieve that or are living that, then that's a different kind of ontology. And so I think Africana philosophy and, and going back to Davis and figures like Sylvia Winter and Aimé Césaire and Martinique. And uh, in terms of um, there have been kind of different Afro kind of British thinkers, Aminata Forna, Paul Gilroy recently was interviewed regarding the kind of the state of not only the post-colonial melancholia that we see in shows like The Crown and all these other things, right? This kind of uh, when, when the kind of, when kind of not only whiteness, but also the idea of the, the empire was this kind of, it was just the crown and it was, it didn't really have people of color and it was very a vertical egalitarian, a vertical equality society, right? How do we think about um, the post-colonial after empire realities of the UK and institutions like Oxford, I take it the move to decolonize the university right, is about just that, which is not saying that there's not a call simply just for merely reforming the curriculum, have a few classes on Fanon and Sylvia Winter over there, right? It's about how can a field like Africana philosophy, as an example of that larger push, how can there be a, not, not only kind of a decentering from a form of rulership made into print in curriculum to thinking about an entirely new way of actually having curriculum that reflects the polity of students and faculty and, 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 and persons in our, in our, in our institution um, and wider world that that should be, I take that's the imperative. And I think what we can learn from Africana philosophy, especially around this idea of freedom is that, that uh, uh, it's not just the term, how do you decolonize, but that if we think of decolonizing as gerund, in other words, right? All right, not merely decolonial, but decolonizing as a gerund, right? It's a process. Is, should by now be clear, I'm a process oriented person. <laughs> that, um, that decolonizing the university or the college is a, is a gerund, it is a process, but it is a process that must take into account the historical examples and struggles of, 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 of people who are trying to live and people who might not have necessarily seen their struggles enacted, but nonetheless are lessons that, that we need to take very seriously and so yeah maybe i'll end, end there but that 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 um that uh that i think democracy and freedom take into these tensions between these models of rule compared to governance and these tensions between individual and collective and and the and movements that center kind of life and that acknowledge that at an epistemological level at the level of knowledge there are those who accept west versus non-west but what would it mean to inhabit a world where we're imagining a post-Western landscape that, um, that it acknowledges kind of geography, but doesn't necessarily take the, the knowledge claims as irrefutable and immutable, right? That, that, that's really what the practice of philosophy is, regardless of what your former discipline and training is. I think that's what public philosophy could do. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, that is sort of what we're attempting here, but I guess it does ask the question, you know, how do you decolonize the colonial? And here maybe I'll defend Plato a bit, how do you democratize what is undemocratic and it's very institution, but um, I think Milty um, has raised um, their hand. So I think, you know, it, it, just feel free to unmute yourself and yeah. 
Hi, I was the person who asked the question about petite marinage, oh, yes. and I wasn't. I wasn't speaking so much in uh, reference to refugees yeah. or uh, migrant refugees. Yeah. I was speaking more about living in a society that doesn't accept you yeah. as you view yourself. Yeah. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of emotional, uh, personal emotional troubles come from having to keep up a mask that you don't believe in but is heavily pushed on you, gender roles that are heavily pushed on women yeah. uh, and, and men. Yeah. And uh, how can, how would petite marinage apply to that? Yeah. Um, uh, because, uh, and I, I used the uh, Cat Stevens reference because that's from my childhood. I, I, lis mm -hmm. I, I listened to Cat Stevens as a child. So, yeah. Um, because that can be extremely difficult. You, you are in a sense uh, sort of stabbing yourself in the heart, but you do it because it, it, in, in a way it is the easiest thing to do, to go yeah. along, to get along and not have to deal day after day with fallout. Yeah. Um, uh, so that was, my, that was really my question. Very helpful, yeah. So uh, now I think I have a better understanding. So, you know, and this is, this is why, in, to be, uh, you know, this is just an example of kind of a text or text that have helped me to think through what I'm hopefully trying to understand more in terms of your question. So I really see Franz Fanon's 1952 work, Black Skin, White Mass, is actually addressing just your question because um, if I understood your, your kind of follow-up, you're asking this not only how can we think about petite marinage, but especially when there are kind of social and structural and historical reasons that our very being of who we are, we're told mm -hmm. either to ourselves, right? Or yeah. told, even if we do love ourselves, then this larger society that we're in doesn't love us back. Am I understanding something right? So then yes. in some sense, how do we reconcile, right? How do we reconcile this um, these, these kind of, these, these dilemmas, the idea of kind of, you know, so Fina talked about it in a, in a few ways that I, that I found, um, uh, that I found helpful. One, um, the, the, you know, well, actually, let me take a step back. And this actually will connect to the Orlando Patterson's work. Um, one of the areas that I think is so interesting about Orlando Patterson is that his earlier work before coming to the States was on kind of maroons. Much of his work is on the maroons and, and he stopped doing that work. But one area statement that he made and that he has maintained, uh, which I would gather Fanon would not accept, um, nor would I, which is that um, Patterson said to understand the condition of the slave, the psychological dimension has no factor uh, in, in understanding the, the idea. In other words, for, for Patterson, you bracket that there is no psychology. And I, Fanon, we have to remember was, tr was a psychiatrist. Fanon never typed anything out. He dictated all of his works, including Black Skin, White Mass, Wretched the Earth, many of the works in between. And so as a psychiatrist, Fanon was trying to understand not only anti-Black racism and colonialism, but, but what he took from Jean-Paul Sartre, the idea of bad faith. What does it mean when a society has created the conditions under which each of, under which those of us, particularly those of us, from kind of marginalized or, or kind of dominated, historically dominated or marginalized or oppressed groups. How is it that, Fanon was trying to understand, how is it that, not merely that we're dominated, but how is it that we, 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 we come to accept our unfreedom? <laughs> how is it that at a psychological level, not merely, it's one thing to talk about when one ends chains around one hand or one's feet. He was mm -hmm. really concerned with what does it mean for us, for us to, um, uh, to actually accept these uh, images. I mean, what does it mean? How many countries and states have laws? I mean, actually going back to Audre Lorde, going back to Audre Lorde uh, in not just this volume, but another one, Audre Lorde talks about when she was going from within the Virgin Islands and someone who she was with had dreadlocks and there was a black woman at the, uh, uh, in the, one of the other islands that they landed in, in customs and, they, and, and, and Lord writes about it, that her friend was told they couldn't enter the island and they said why and they said well your hair right you have you have dreadlocks like that's there was a law there was actually a law on the books of the uh, within the island within the Antilles that said you cannot have you know hair you know that that in terms of uh what we one, one might call kind of natural hair that that was literally illegal right and so going back to Fanon what does it mean to even say that 
growing one's hair, the way that it comes out of our head is dangerous, right? So the first, in terms of at the individual level, because black skin and white mass is, is really very much at the individual level, even though it is concerned with social structures, is thinking about how do we come to understand um, kind of different what Fanon called kind of these different kind of neuroses, you know, the, you know, kind of not only kind of acts of bad, uh, acts of bad faith. What he used though, I think um, in one of the chapters, rightfully so, he's come under the biggest critique, the woman of color and the black man, when he coins this term lactification, right? This desire for whiteness. What does it mean for individuals kind of uh, Afro-Antillians, uh, but also by extension kind of Africans and Africans in diaspora in the modern period to uh, to want to whiten themselves or take creams or do anything but, but be who they are. Two questions, as you mentioned, of not only kind of gender and sex, um, but also other things that are are they define us. But either we have we've been we've been inculcated at the level of culture to believe that um, that there's something wrong with us. Um, whether we whether we have been deluded into believing that we should just like it, or whether we acknowledge that we have a that that this is who we are. But you know what? We make a choice because we believe that that choice and have reasons to believe that, that choice is going to have repercussions that will adversely affect us uh, at an individual level or maybe our families and by extension. And that is, that, is very, um, that is very real. It is something in terms of the second text that we see with Frederick Douglass in terms of his different autobiographies um, from the narrative of life of Frederick Douglass to the other two, when he's thinking about that kind of famous fight with the slave breaker Covey, still at the individual level, but ultimately what does it mean to then take a disposition that, um, that we want to act, we wanna figure out a way to, um, uh, yes, there's this larger structure, but on an individual level that perhaps the first, one of the first modes of trying to get free is to recognize that we had an, a kind of, we had an ability for Douglas it initially was this kind of fight but it was the after that fight with the slave breaker Covey, Douglas in the law in Maryland was still in, an enslaved person. But at the, at, in terms of his mind, he came to realize that, wait a minute, resistance was actually something that I had the capacity to do kind of all along. So if I could physically resist, then perhaps there's certain, and, 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 at the cognitive and epistemological level, maybe there are different forms of resistance that one may need. Now, third point, um, uh, the, at the level of lyricism, lyrical thought, you know, but Nesta Marley had that, um, I can't sing, but he had that song, um, you know, Running Away. You guys know this song? You know, he says, you know, you're running, he says, you know, you're running and you're running and you're running away, but you can't run away from yourself. He says it much more beautifully than I do. And now to your pointed part about Petit Marinage, there are ways in which Petit Marinage does enable us to um, take a form of flight that allows us to begin to kind of reckon with those dynamics of bad faith and lactification and these different neuroses that have, have made us wanna hate or love our chains. Right? At the same time, there are ways in which petite marinage um, might not necessarily, in the physical sense, not the, not the psychological sense, but in terms, of, um, in terms of certain forms of taking kind of, uh, kind of taking individual flight in the physical sense, there are some times when kind of um, we might um, we might move away from an expanse or a space uh, that us moving away might not necessarily change the needle in terms of the isms and the structures that have uh, created the conditions of uh, of bad faith itself. But there are moments like the Octavia Butler point in which. Uh, in which it does. So I don't think there's a one size fits all and I, that might be a fairly unsatisfying answer. But I do think that, um, I, 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 uh, I do believe that when we think about freedom and unfreedom, that we have to, what I was calling these different valences that include the physical, but these kind of other levels that we need to kind of keep our attention on that such that to your point about petite marinage that I think petite marinage depending on context, kind of depending on context, May offer um, may offer up uh, something that's very powerful and very transformative, and in a, depending on other contexts, might simply be re physical relocation with the same 
uh, kind of issues that um, that one was facing in that um, in that in that moment. But nonetheless, it, it's 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 important. The kind of the confrontation with that reality, the kind of the dread condition, is 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 really important. So that's how I'd answer it. I realize I might not have answered in all the ways you you were were hoping, but that, but I do think that that's um, that, that 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 thinking about even petite marinage in those nuanced ways um, is 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 rightfully. Um, oh no 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 that was that was an absolutely marvelous answer thank you thank yeah. you so much a hard quit but a great but important one right an important question thank you um i realize we've gone over time so i think i would end the recording here but if anyone wants to hang back uh to make comments that i'm still the meeting's still going so okay